Okay, can is my screen showing up with the uh, cover of the book? Yep, looks good. Okay, fantastic, and it's full screen and all that. Um, yeah, and for everybody that's watching, make sure you put um, your viewing into speaker mode so you'll be able to see um, his presentation in full screen. Okay. No, well, no. I'm, go ahead. Nope, you're good to go. Okay, I thought I heard someone starting to talk, so just wanted to make sure that I wasn't interrupting anyone. Okay, so um, first thing I wanna do is to thank the Historical Society for the invitation to speak today and to all of you who are investing part of your Saturday afternoons to listen. I'm gonna be talking today about my most recent book, Timber Industry Ghosts, but I uh, wanna give a couple of quick notes first. Um, the book covers remnants of the timber industry across most of the Western United States uh, at the request of the Historical Society. Uh, this talk is gonna be centered on Humboldt, Del Norte and Mendocino counties. Second, the book itself contains only contemporary pictures. The format of this presentation allows me to add a lot of historical photos, maps, and additional photos that are not otherwise in the original book. Uh, as a quick way of introducing myself, as we've said, my name is Jeff Moore. I'm talking to you today from my home near Elko, Nevada. My dad worked as a California state park ranger, and I grew up in a couple of state parks, but spent most of my youth at MacArthur Bernie Falls Memorial State Park in Eastern Shasta County. I've been fascinated by trains and railroad history my entire life, and my child home, home lay about a mile and a half from the McLeod River Railroad's Lake Britain Bridge, made famous by the movie Stand By Me and later an Aerosmith music video. Uh, McLeod River Railroad was affiliated with the McLeod River Lumber Company, which uh, operated one of the largest pine mills in the West Coast in McLeod on the southeastern flank of Mount Shasta. After graduating from Bernie High School, I spent the next year, six years of my life at Humboldt State, during which time I was occasionally active with what was then the Northern Counties Logging Interpretive Association and is now the Timber Heritage Association. And I also was active on the Humboldt Bay and Eureka Model Railroad Club before moving to Nevada. Um, I still have many ties to the North Coast area, uh, but kind of because of where I grew up, the bulk of my research and the previous five books I've written have been about the pine, principally about the pine lumber industry and associated railroads in Northeastern California and Central and Eastern Oregon. This presentation will draw some materials from my California Lumber Short Lines book, which does have several chapters on railroads on the North Coast. In order to provide some context for the book, I'm gonna spend the first part of this talk covering some basics of the redwood lumber industry history. I'm gonna start by acknowledging that the timber industry and forest products cover a wide range of commodities, including things like clean water, air, wildlife habitat, and fuel. This book, the Timber Industry Ghost Book, focuses primarily on the traditional forms of industrial wood products. Sawmilling as an industry may have started in France as early as the 1200s and was widespread in Europe by the 1500s. The first sawmills on the North American continent were a human powered one established at Jamestown Colony in 1625 and a water powered mill built at South Berwick Township, Maine in 1631. Steam power largely replaced both of the mills by the year or both the earlier technologies by the early 1800s. Sawmilling as a commercial enterprise in California started in the 1830s and then dramatically expanded after Jane Marshall's gold discovery in 1848, with much of the initial focus on the coastal redwood regions. The first sawmill on the shores of Humboldt Bay opened in 1850, and by 1855, nine sawmills cutting 200,000 board feet of lumber and 80,000 feet of loft per day existed around the bay. Operations of any sawmill is dependent on two primary factors, the availability of trees and the ability of the owners to sell lumber at a sufficient rate to cover production costs. A sawmill of any size will very quickly cut through all the readily available trees and much of the fascination with and legacy of the timber industry lay in the methods developed to transport logs ever increasing distances from the logging areas to the mill. 
The first step after felling a tree was removing the branches and bucking the trunk into logs. In this photo, black powder has been used to blow apart the logs to make them easier to pull out of the woods in one early Humboldt County operation. Animals provided the first real solution to moving logs overland, usually on specially built skid roads, such as the one seen in these three photos. Um, one of them is a postcard. The next advancement to place logs on wagons, which reduced the frictions and lengthened the feasible haul distances. In this photo, other animals out of sight to the right are preparing to pull a redwood log up ramps and onto a wagon in a practice known as parbuckling. Next step in the evolution placed those wagons on primitive tramways, quickly replaced by rail cars. Claims for the first true logging railroad ranged from the Fox, Weston, and Bronson in Lindley, Steuben County, New York in 1852 to a Scott Garish in Southern Michigan in 1876. The first true logging railroads in the Redwood region started being built in the late 1870s and the rail network dramatically expanded starting in the early 1880s. The advent of the logging railroads coincided with another major logging technology advancement, the steam donkey, patented in 1881 by John Dolbeer of Eureka's story, Dolbeer and Carson Lumber Company. Dolbeer claimed to get the inspiration for the machines from various hoists and lifts he saw used to load and unload ships along the Eureka waterfront. Donkeys quickly supplanted or replaced animals in many wood chores, including skidding logs in from the woods and parbuckling logs onto rail cars as depicted in this early colorized postcard. One of the major drawbacks of railroads is that they are extremely expensive to build, operate and maintain, even on logging railroads that tended to spare every expense, but the increased logging production of the railroads and steam donkeys allowed sawmills to become large industrial facilities that could make and sell enough lumber to cover the production costs. One of the major obstacles most redwood loggers faced was shipping. Everything related to building the lumber industry had to be brought in by ships until the Northwestern Pacific completed the rail link with the outside world in 1914. But many isolated operations on the coast never did get a rail connection. While adequate wharfs were eventually built in Humboldt Bay and a select very few other semi-protected anchorages, ship sizes and capacities were still limited by sandbars at the mouth of the bay for decades and lumber operations elsewhere had to rely on dog hole ports such as this one. These factors significantly limited the size of locomotives that could be imported. The number two of the Casper operations just south of Fort Bragg re represents a typical delivery story. Baldwin built this locomotive new for Casper in 1885 and shipped it from the factory to Pennsylvania, from, from the factory in Pennsylvania to San Francisco, where it was disassembled, the pieces loaded onto crates and then placed on a schooner. Once at Casper, the schooner placed the crates on flat bottom barges while the boiler was plugged and floated ashore. The pieces then had to be dragged across the beach then up to the top of the bluff before it could be reassembled and placed in operation. The limits on the equipment size and shipping situation dictated led, the limits on equipment size, the shipping situation dictated led to somewhat incongruous situation of some of the world's largest logs being pulled by some of the smallest locomotives around during the early year of the industry. Other early examples of early locomotives used in the redwood lumber industry are typified by the Holmes Eureka Lumber Number no. 1 in the upper left, Elk River Mill and Lumber Number no. 2 in the upper right, and then by two locomotives of Crescent City's Hobbs Wall and Company operations on the bottom. Reflection of the growing purchasing power and importance of logging roads can be seen in the various types of locomotives designed or adapted to the specific and often harsh operating conditions found in the industry. Two years after patenting the donkey engine, John Dolbeer patented a gear-driven locomotive and donkey engine hybrid commonly called the gypsy locomotive. Two forward-facing cylinders mounted on the frame turned by gears, a large geared wheel on the front of the locomotive, which could be positioned either to power the capstan drums or the front axle. A side rod transferred power to the rear axle. The locomotives mostly built by San Francisco based Marshutes and Cantrell or Globe Iron Works found with some success in the redwood lumber industry, but limited use elsewhere. 
Other types of gear-driven steam locomotives were much more successful. By far the most common was the Shea, designed by Michigan logger Ephraim Shea and patented by him in 1881. The Shea locomotive featured cylinders mounted vertically on the right side of the boiler that drove a coupled drive shaft extending the length of the locomotive. This arrangement also forced the boiler to be offset to the left side of the machine. The drive shaft powered each axle by gears. Shea sold the patent for his locomotive to the Lima Locomotive Works of Lima, Ohio, who went on to build approximately 2,770 Shays in two, three, and four truck varieties between 1878 and 1945. Shays became very common on redwood loggers, especially after 1900. Five of the many examples of Shays used in the region are seen here. Howard Creek Lumber, Union Landing on the upper left, Hammond Redwood in Carlotta in the upper right, California Barrel in Arcata in the middle, Rockport Redwood, Rockport on the lower left, and then the Northern Redwood Lumber Company at Corbell in the lower right. Jay had two principal competitors in the geared steam market. Charles L. Heisler patented the geared steam loco locomotive bearing his name in 1892. Heisler's design featured two large cylinders inclined in a V powering the drive shaft underneath the boiler's center line. The shaft powered one axle in each truck with the side rods transferring power to the other axle. The large cylinders and simple gear arrangements made the Heisler the fastest of all the geared steam locomotives. Heisler assigned his patents to Stearns Manufacturing Company in 1894, who along with corporate successor Heisler Locomotive Works built roughly 625 Heislers in a production run lasting until 1941. The Northern Redwood Lumber Company of Corbell was the largest user of Heislers in the Redwood region, owning four of them. Others include the Elk River Mill of Lumber, which is pictured on the lower left, which had one. The locomotive in the lower right stretches the geographic bounds of this talk slightly, as it was the sole steam locomotive used on the only railroad built in Lake County, a logging railroad about 10 miles north of Upper Lake, and it's seen here abandoned several years after that operation closed. The Climax Locomotive Works built the third type of geared steam locomotives popular in the logging industry. Pennsylvania logger Charles Scott designed the locomotive, the later versions of which featured two cylinders inclined at a 22 and a half degree angle, driving a shaft that passed underneath the boiler, which in turn powered another shaft running the length of the locomotive that powered all axles through gears. Climaxes were renowned for their tracking abilities. It was said they could follow two lines scratched in dirt, but were never popular with crews due to the vibrations of the many moving parts. The Climax Manufacturing Company of Corey, Pennsylvania built approximately 1,035 locomotives between 1888 and 1928. Examples of Climaxes used in the Redwood region are Casper South Fork and Eastern at the upper left, Holmes Eureka at the upper right, and then the big three truck model of the Pacific Lumber Company at the bottom. Uh, Pacific Locomotive, Pacific Lumber Company locomotive got stranded on the wrong side of the eel due to a bridge washout sometime in the 1940s. And it was a roadside oddity and attraction on Highway 101 for several years until it was finally scrapped. Through shipping and harbor facilities and then the completion of the Northwestern Pacific allowed for larger traditional rod driven steam locomotives, many cast off from mainline railroads to find employment on redwood logging railroads. The locomotives on the top of this photo, or the locomotive on the bottom of this photo, rates uh, or this screen rates special mention as Hammond Lumber built it in their Samoa shops around 1910. The upper two locomotives are another Hammond locomotive on the upper left, and then a California Western Railroad locomotive on the upper right. Baldwin Locomotive Works was one of the primary builders of the early years adapting or designing traditional steam locomotives for the steep grades, sharp curves, light rail, and uncertain track work typical of most logging railroads. Baldwin pioneered their double-ended locomotives in the 1870s. The combination of pilot and trailing wheels made the locomotive equally adept at moving either direction, and the trailing wheels generally allowed for larger fireboxes, which increased steaming ability. 
the smallest version, the 242 real arrangement, two pilot wheels, four drivers, two trailing wheels, found a lot of favor in the Redwood region for a lot of the shipping reasons and limitations previously discussed. Examples of this type are on the Crescent City and Smith River Road in the upper left, the EJ Dodge Company south of Eureka in the lower left, and the Glenn Peterson Company to the right. All of these are tank type locomotives in which the water is carried in tanks slung over or next to the boiler, while fuel is carried in the bunker behind the cap. 262 or prairie type was almost certainly the most common wheel arrangement on logging railroads everywhere. One of these rates special mention. Baldwin built this machine named the Sequoia for a display at the Lewis and Clark Exposition in Portland in 1905. The locomotive demonstrated on several logging roads in the Northwest in and around the exposition. The Dolbeer and Carson Lumber Company was so impressed with the machine they bought it. The locomotive worked over 40 years on the DNC's various operations before they scrapped it. Examples of other prairies used in the Redwoods are the Pacific Lumber Company at the upper left, which had three, the Dolbeer and Carson number three at the upper right, one of California Western's three large prairies at the lower left that were the mainstay of their mainline hall for several decades. And finally, the number five of the California and Oregon Lumber Company, which hauled redwood logs for a few years from the Rowdy Creek drainage north of Crescent City, north across the state line to their mill in Brookings, Oregon. Several builders also constructed prairies and tank varieties, which tended to improve their operating usefulness as they didn't have to drag a tender around with them. And the weight of the water over the drivers increased adhesion and pulling power on steep grades. But this came at the cost of significantly limited operating range. Examples of tank prairies in the Redwoods are Casper South Fork and Eastern number three at the upper left and California Northwestern, later Northwestern Pacific number 202, destined to spend most of its life on the isolated Albion branch. California Western had four such machines. They bought three of them new from Baldwin such they were all pretty much identical to the one at lower left. And then the fourth, there are 14, they acquired from the California Fruit Exchange operations in Gray Eagle, California. Relatively common in the logging industry as a whole, but less so in the Redwoods was the 282 or Mikado type. The larger size and longer wheelbase made them less adept at negotiating typical logging or trackage, but they could be effectively used on mainline hulls. Two examples of Mikados in the Redwood region are the Hammond Lumber 15 in the upper left-hand corner and the California Western Number 44 at the upper right. The bottom locomotive is one of about two dozen tank-type tank, tank type Mikados the American Locomotive Company designed and built specifically for the logging railroad industry. Finally, Baldwin built over 40 examples of their Mallee type for logging railroads, which consisted of two sets of driving wheels under a single boiler. Only four such machines, all two 662 wheel arrangements operating in the Redwoods, two on the Casper South Fork and Eastern operations at the, at the top, and the bottom two we'll cover later in the presentation. Steam donkey, donkey technology improved along with locomotives. Larger machines with more capabilities allowed for new logging practices, such as the high leader skyline logging. In a typical arrangement, loggers would limb and top a spar tree, usually out or near the ridge top, which would then be secured with guy wires. This is an example of a fully rigged spar tree that's on display at the Camp 18 Logging Museum and Restaurant west of Portland, Oregon. Once set up, the rigging could be used to bring logs in from an entire hillside and occasionally the opposite hillside and narrow drainages. This tree is equipped with a hay rack boom, which would be used to load the logs on the rail cars. Deploying this technology meant the logging railroads quite often had to run at or near ridge tops, and in many cases, inclines provided the easiest way to gain the required elevation. One such incline on the Northern Redwood Lumber Company operation can be seen here on the right along with a camp established to house the loggers as they worked increasingly farther into the forest. Large hoisting engines placed at the top of an incline would raise and lower log cars and other equipment. 
a loaded log car is seen in this view nearing the bottom of another northern redwood lumber incline somewhere up the North Fork of the Mad River. This photo is of, a, of another northern redwood lumber camp at the top of an incline. Note one of their Heislers in the middle of the photograph on the main line and the hoisting engine positioned at the top of the incline is to the right. Finally, while woods camps placed loggers closer to where they worked, most operations came to rely on self-propelled vehicles, such as these Gibson-built speeders on the Bill Beer and Carson operations to transport loggers between camps and the active logging areas. Taken together, the railroad logging era produced probably the most enormously influential period on the industry's history. The sheer expense associated with the railroads required moving enormous quantities of timber to justify that investment. Logging railroads also allowed sawmills to become stationary, semi-permanent industrial fixtures on the landscape, economic and social forces in their own right. Uh, the stars on this map each represent the place of operations of a logging railroad in the Redwood region. Some of these stars represent small operations with short railroads, while others represent far-flung operations with dozens to hundreds of miles of track in disparate locations. A couple of these are tan bark operations, which harvested bark from oak trees for use in cattle hide tanning. Nevertheless, this gives some indication of the sheer size and scale of the logging railroad industry in the Redwood region. New internal combustion technologies rad radically reshaped the industry starting especially in the late 1910s and early 1920s. First is the logging tractor. In 1925, the CL Best Traction Company and Holt Tractor Company merged to form Caterpillar Tractor Company. Both manufacturers had previously made 60 horsepower gas power tractors, but the new Caterpillar 60 immediately became the gold standard in the logging industry and started replacing remaining animal and steam power on a wholesale basis. Diesel powered tractors shortly replaced the early gas models with related increases in power and efficiency and logging arches shortly resolved problems with dragging logs caused shortly resolved problems with dragging logs causing unacceptable disturbance to forest floor soils. Meanwhile, the first experiments with logging trucks started around 1913 and by the early 1920s, they started coming into their own. Trucks especially made possible to log areas logging roads could not economically access and the overall lower cost structure of truck logging significantly lowered the capital barriers of entry to the industry. The combination of log and lumber trucks made it suddenly possible to build new smaller mills not on railroad lines or dog hole ports. Internal combustion also replaced steam on large railroad logging machines such as this slack line rigging on the Dolbeer and Carson operations. The timber industry as a whole also started reacting to the immense backlash from the destructive forestry practices of the previous decades and started generally trending towards replacing landscape scale clear cuts with either selective logging or smaller patchwork clear cuts, which also tended to favor truck over railroad logging and timber companies started replacing logging roads with trucks in mass, especially in the early 1950s. There were some efforts to sell diesel electric locomotive technology to loggers. The Baldwin Locomotive Works provided two prime examples in the Redwood region when it sent three diesel demonstrator units, a six axle 1500 horsepower model seen at top on California Western's 10 mile branch north of Fort Bragg in 1947. And then a pair of 750 horsepower switchers that spent part of the summer of 1951 working in the Redwoods one of which is seen with the Pacific Lumber Company log train at Alton at the lower left, and then at the Northern Redwood Lumber Company engine house at Corabell at the lower right. On the whole, however, only two logging roads on the North Coast ended up buying diesels, as both existed in highly specialized situations where trucks could bring logs from large geographic areas into a single reload point, with the railroad reduced to just a mainline haul. Hammond Lumber bought this 660 horsepower American Locomotive Company diesel in 1950, and it made three trips a day over the remaining Samoa to Cronell mainline. Successor Georgia Pacific replaced the Alco with a 900 horsepower General Motors built switcher in 1959, 
which hauled trains until the line closed in 1961. That locomotive is seen in the bottom photo at Feather Falls, California, shortly after leaving Samoa. Pacific Lumber Company operated the other surviving logging road stretching over the Northwestern Pacific Main Line from Scotia to Alton, and then up the Carlotta Branch to reach its own tracks up Yager Creek. The operations finally ended in 1978, although an in-plant switching road in the Scotia Mill carried on until about 1992. Some commercial log moves continued to happen on common carrier operations as the California Western continued hauling uh, periodic raw log movements from points along its road in the late 1970s, and the Eureka Southern handled some interline raw log traffic and even operated some occasional dedicated log trains into the late 1980s. Thanks for sticking with me to this point. We're going to drop into the main part of the presentation. Uh, the ever-changing face of the industry has been related through this introduction has left many ghosts in its wake. One form is the imprints and remnants of the vast infrastructure the industry once built. Everything from logging railroad grades to trestles to now empty log ponds to foundations to parts of old sawmills. The second form this presentation will explore is logging equipment and technologies on static display. The third form is equipment and places the industry once used that have been repurposed. The last form is the miscellaneous remnants that don't neatly fit into the above categories. Part one, abandoned in place. Among my paternal grandfather's photos from the late 1940s is a snapshot of cables wrapped around a large stump, most likely on or near the tree farm in the mountains west of Drain, Oregon, at which my grandmother spent the last years of her childhood. The cables are the remnants of a guy wire supporting a nearby spar tree once used to skid logs into a central landing in a previous logging operation a common method employed to harvest the old growth forests on the steep slopes of the coastal ranges after 1920. These cables are emblematic of the many relics of the various aspects of the timber industry has left behind. Countless of the number of sites at which sawmills and other forest product plants of any size once existed. Some of these are relatively intact while others are marked by a few foundations while many more have been redeveloped into shopping centers or housing developments that have completely obliterated all trace of the industry's existence. It's hard to find any forests that haven't been logged multiple times in the last century and a half and while today's loggers take their tools and equipment with them, their predecessors did not always so do. It's not uncommon to find traces of early logging operations ranging from lengths of cable to rail to sometimes almost intact pieces of equipment. Other ghosts of the timber industry past consist of things like old logging camps, abandoned railroad grades, trestle remnants, and other parts and pieces of long obsolete technologies and equipment. Logging is and was one of the most dangerous occupations in the world. It's one thing to look at photos of early loggers at work it's quite another to come face to face with the evidence of their labor in the woods, such as springboard notches 10 or more feet off the ground on redwood stumps, the camps in which they lived and the occasional intact steam donkey or other equipment they used and left abandoned. First section of this presentation is devoted to some of these remnants as they appear on the landscape, largely at the spot at which they were last used, specifically to place them in context, explain their importance and try to relate some of the stories they could tell. We'll start this tour with uh, this section with the Arcata Wharf. Discovery and early exploitation of Humboldt Bay was initially prompted by creating shorter routes into the new mining districts in Weaverville rather than anything related to timber. California legislature authorized building the wharf into the bay from Union as Arcata was then known in 1854. And on December 15th of that year, a group of investors incorporated the Union Wharf and Plankwalk Company which completed the two mile long wharf by May of the following year. The initial wooden, wooden railed railroad line running from downtown Union out along the wharf built to the odd gauge of 45 and a quarter inches, gradually morphed into the Arcata Transportation Company in 1878 and then to the Arcata and Mad River Railroad in 1881. The Corbell brothers of wine fame bought the AMR and extended it to North Fork, now named Corbell, where their Humboldt Lumber Mill Company produced redwood lumber to make wine barrels. 
The Corbells sold the operation to the Northern Redwood Lumber Company in 1903, which was partially controlled by the Charles Nelson Steamship Company. The maritime influence of the owners meant that the ANMR continued sending all freight it handled out onto the wharf and did not start interchanging cars with the Northwestern Pacific until 1925, 11 years after the railing to the outside world had been opened. Railroading on the wharf ended in 1933 and the ANMR abandoned its tracks through Arcata and out onto the wharf in 1941. Today, all the remains of the wharf are the stubs of pilings visible at low tide from the Arcata parking marsh parking lot at the end of I Street. Around 1893, high property prices on Eureka's waterfront prompted brothers Edgar and Silas Vance to purchase substantial acreage on the peninsula separating Humboldt Bay from the Pacific Ocean due west of Eureka. The brothers had inherited substantial lumbering road operations and the new site named Samoa after the South Pacific Islands, then famous due to tribal wars, gave them the room to build their mo new modern band mill they desired. Construction also included docks, a new railroad extending north from Samoa towards the timberlands, a roundhouse and machine shop to house and maintain logging and railroad equipment, and a complete company town to serve all the needs of their employees. The Samoa mill opened for business near the end of 1894. The Vance brothers only operated the property for six years as on 1st September 1900, they sold out to A.B. Hammond. Hammond already had substantial, mostly timber industry oriented holdings in Oregon, Montana, Louisiana, and elsewhere. The Hammond Company expanded and modernized the operation under several different names over the next half century before selling out to Georgia Pacific Corporation in 1956. GP added a stud mill, a plywood plant, and a pulp mill to the Samoa operations, but closed the logging road in 1961. In 1972, GP included the Samoa operations and the portion of its assets spun off to the newly created Louisiana Pacific Corporation in order to settle complaints the Federal Trade Commission filed against GP. Louisiana Pacific sold the paper mill and shut down all other facilities in 1995, but by 2008, the paper mill closed at well. Little remains of the sawmill, save for the concrete slabs and occasional old sign, the Port of Humboldt Bay now owns most of the sawmill site and other industrial properties. The old Hammond Railroad Roundhouse and Machine Shop still stand and today house the Timber Heritage Association collect collection of logging locomotives and other artifacts of the Humboldt County timber industry. And the group runs feeder trips on short stretches of restored railroad lines around the bay and one day hopes to start a tourist railroad operation. Benson Timber Company acquired the rest of the Samoa town site from Louisiana Pacific, along with the company's timberlands in 1998, and then sold it at auction in 2001. The town is presently owned by the Danco Group, a local investment company, which is in the process of redeveloping the town and starting the process of selling the houses, with the current occupants having the first opportunities to buy them. Perhaps the best known remnant of the town is the famous Samoa Cookhouse, originally built to feed company employees, but now offering a full logging camp meal service catering to the tourist trade. Other ghosts around the town include the huge communal garage, of which almost every company town seemed to have at least one, and the Samoa Block, a 24,000 square foot building that once contained the company offices, store, and other facilities. Countless sawmills once ringed the shores of Humboldt Bay, and nearly every drainage cutting back into the mountains had a logging railroad built up it at one time or another. Flanagan, Brosnan, and company built the Bayside Mill in 1876, initially processing timber logged on Jacoby Creek north of the city and rafted down the bay. By 1909, new owners shifted the logging to new holdings located up the Van Dusen River, with the Northwestern Pacific Railroad handling the logs down to Eureka. In 1929, the Humboldt Redwood Company purchased the mill and the Hammond Lumber Company immediately bought a half interest in the company. The depression caused the mill to close in 1932, at which time Hammond acquired full ownership. Hammond reopened the facilities as their Bayside Mill in 1937. Though dwarfed by the main Hammond facilities in Samoa, 
The mill remained a small but important part of the company's operations up to the point Georgia Pacific took over in 1956. GP didn't like the idea of having two essentially duplicate facilities in the same neighborhood, and they closed the Bayside Mill in 1960. Today, the most substantial relic of the mill is the log dump built out over Humboldt Bay, which amazingly enough still has rails on it. Looming across the bay in the background is the long closed GP paper mill in Samoa. One last look at the log dump structure, which appears to be lined with sticks of railroad rail. This would be on the side that the logs rolled off the cars. Not far south of the old Bayside Mill are remains of another log dump. The Bucksport and Elk River Railroad built a railroad line from Bucksport up the Elk River drainage between 1883 and 1886. The Dolbeer and Carson Lumber Company had used the Bucksburg and Elk River to haul logs from its holdings up the Elk River until the dispute with the other owner caused DSC to move its operations to its holding elsewhere in 1895. In 1933, the DNC purchased the line and extended it in both directions into its holdings up the North Fork of the Elk River and about a mile north along the bay from Bucksport where they built the new log dump. DNC trains carried company timber out of the Elk River drainage for 20 years from 1933 until 1953. The logs would be rafted three miles farther up the bay to the DNC mill, which is today the vacant ground mostly underneath the Samoa Bridge. Disconnected segments of the log dump remain today. This vintage photo shows the Dolbear and Carson number three with the log track on the log dump. This repeat photo shows that that part of the trestle work is missing today. Surviving parts of the dump are trestle work closer, closer to land and the dump structure itself still standing in the middle of the bay almost 60 years after the last logs rolled off flat cars and into the water. In 1882, at the other end of the Bucksport and Elk River, a group of landowners up the Elk River southeast of Eureka invited experienced lumberman Noah Falk to help them develop their holdings. And together they incorporated the Elk River Mill and Lumber Company. Noah's younger brother, Elijah, joined the effort and together the Falk brothers built the sawmill, which cut its first boards in 1884 and registered its first commercial shipments in 1886. The mill and lumber yards took up nearly all available space on a shelf above the Elk River, which forced the buildings making up the surrounding town named Falk up onto the adjacent hillsides. A logging railroad built up the Elk River bought log, brought logs to the mill and the Bucksport and Elk River Railroad handled the finished lumber eight miles down to the docks on the bay. Noah ran the company well until 1920 when he retired and sold his interests. The new ownership carried on until the depression idled the facilities in 1930. The company's, uh, company attempted to come back in 1936, but by then the antiquated status of the facilities impaired the mill's ability to compete and it closed for good within a year. The last residents moved out in 1944 and the lumber company scrapped out the logging railroad and most of the equipment just before the Bucksport and Elk River salvaged its line into Falk in 1951. A few squatters held on until around 1961. Then after that, only a caretaker on the fringe of the property remained until the early 1980s. The abandoned town started to gain some notoriety as the 1970s progressed, which caused the landowner to dynamite almost all of the buildings in 1979. The land under the Falk town site eventually passed into the hands of the Pacific Lumber Company. Falk lay adjacent to the Headwaters Forest, a 3,000 acre grove of old growth redwood that became the flashpoint between the timber industry and environmentalists when Palco laid plans to log the trees in the late 1980s. Many years of face-offs running from lawyers crashing in courts to direct confrontation between loggers and environmentalists in the woods ended with a 1996 agreement under which the company agreed to sell the tract plus 4,000 acres of surrounding second and third growth redwood to the federal government in exchange for cash and administrative reprieve on logging the rest of the company's timberlands. The agreement took a few years to work out and in 1999, title to the Headwaters Forest, including the Falk Town site, passed to the US government's Bureau of Land Management. Falk Bay is a quiet place located a mile or so up a paved trail. BLM has placed many interpretive signs and panels showing historic photographs and explaining the natural and human history of the site. 
Remnants of the town and industry that thrived there include a few rotted timbers of the once expensive bulkheads built to protect the mill from the Elk River and two vintage dump trucks, the barn in which they were parked at the end, of, at the end long, having, long since having melted into the forest floor. Others include colorful lilac bushes marking the long gone entrance to a house, a small shack, a few foundations, and various pieces of trash poking up through the uh, thick vegetation. Most forest types, the stumps of log trees tend to rot away after a few decades. The major exception is the redwoods where the towering stumps remain standing a full 130 or more years after the trees have been cut. Redwoods have a generous butt swell near the ground and loggers had to cut above that in order to get to the straight grain wood. This forced them to work often 10 to 20 or more feet up off the ground, standing on springboards inserted into notches cut into the tree. Logging even more so than the now was hard and grueling work and it would usually take a two man falling team a week or more to cut down one of these giant trees. Stump pictured here is one of the many lining the trail in the Falk town site that is typical of many such ghosts of the logging past scattered throughout the Redwood region. Most of these stumps also have the next generation of redwoods growing out of them either directly from the stump or from the surrounding root system. Lumbermen Bill Herndon and Don Martin built the Englewood Lumber Company mill, typical of the small mills enabled by truck technology in 1951. This is in Redway. The mill passed through a series of owners and hosted a plywood plant owned by a third party from 1955 to 1967. At some point around the later 1970s, Eel River Sawmills bought the mill and operated as their Englewood division. The Eel River Company dated from 1958 and the Englewood operation was a sideshow to their principal mill just north of Rio Dell. Eel River sawmills lived almost exclusively on US Forest Service timber sales for decades, taking full advantage of a program that reserved a healthy percentage of agency timber sales for small companies like theirs. The company tried purchasing its own timberlands after a variety of factors reduced Forest Service timber sales to a trickle but couldn't make the economics work out. The ax fell on the Englewood mill in 2000 and the Rio Del mill in 2003. A subsequent owner bought the main mill but was only able to keep it going until 2005 when it finally closed. The mill at Redcrest now lies mostly abandoned though some economic activity is trying to take hold in a few of the old structures. An old mailbox sticks through a hole cut in a fence that reinforces the no visitors policy both next to a sign bearing the name of another vanished company. Inside the fence are bilingual signs promoting a safety culture to employees that are never coming back. Number of railroads projected routes connect Crescent City with the outside world, but none of them ever came really close to fulfilling those goals. This did not stop a healthy redwood lumber industry from developing in the area, and it grew to support a modest local railroad network. The Hobbs Wall and Company built a large mill in Crescent City about 1871, and within a few years, the company broke ground on a logging road running north of town. About 1912, Hobbs Wall completed its logging north of the city. The company abandoned its northern line and started building a new railroad to the south, eventually incorporated as the Del Norte Southern, so as to have the power to condemn a right of way through an otherwise uncooperative landowner and to be prepared for any railroad that might reach the area from the outside world. The Del Norte Southern Main Line eventually extended out about 10 miles and several branches tapped timber stands off of this line. All of those lines are shown in red on this map. The sources list the end of the Del Norte Southern as coming sometime between 1935 and 1940 when Hobbs Wall exhausted its timber reserves. The Hobbs Wall Mill is now the Safeway Shopping Center in Crescent City. One of the few remnants of the company's railroad system are a few still standing vents of a trestle over a gulch not far off Highway 101, a few miles south of Crescent City. Finally, the extension of the Arcata and Mad River Railroad up the Mad River, the Corps Bells built in 1883, required four large trestles and a bridge across the Mad River. Largest of the trestles span the Warren Creek drainage and a and freight is seen here heading for Corbell sometime in the middle 1950s. a 
wheat and MR's existence became increasingly dependent on the large Northern Railroad Lumber Company and then Simpson Mill and Corbell. The A and MR's end came in 1984 when Simpson closed the road in favor of a truck to rail car reload near Arcata. The Eureka Southern Railroad purchased and resurrected the Arcata in Mad River in 1988, but the revival only lasted until weakened bridges and deteriorated track conditions forced the successor North Coast Railroad to end operations in 1993. North Coast salvaged the rails in late 1997. The Warren Creek trestle and the other trestles still stand, though in deteriorating shape, while the various forces debate the future of the right of way. I go into part two, which is stuffed and mounted. Very little captured the American imagination for most of the 19th and 20th centuries, like the sights and sounds of a working steam locomotive. The machines at the time represented so much from the promise of technological advancement to the thrill of speed and motion to the beckoning of new opportunities over the horizon. To the lumber industry from the late 1800s through the middle of the 1900s, the steam locomotive represented an efficient way to extract logs from the forest. And in many ways, the development of the logging road is what allowed the lumber industry to move off the water and become the primary economic driver in large parts of the company, country. The growing economic cloud of the logging industry in turn prompted manufacturers to either develop themselves or perfect and build specialized equipment designed to meet the challenges of the extreme operating environments in which the industry worked. The rapidly changing face of technology after World War II very quickly relegated the steam locomotive from a wonder to a relic. By this point, the logging road itself as an institution was rapidly disappearing as roads improved and the logging industry discovered the substantially cheaper economics of truck logging. Changing logging patterns also helped stack the decks against the logging road as selective logging or small patchwork clear cuts replaced the landscape level clear cutting of the previous century. This served to significantly reduce the volume of logs moving from any one geographical area, which heavily favored trucks over trains itself. Only a few logging railroads survived past the middle 1950s, and those that did typically consisted of little more than a mainline haul from one or more truck to rail reloads down to the mill. The bulk of these also closed by the early 1980s, and the very last logging railroad operated by Western Forest Products on the north end of Vancouver Island shut down after suffering a severe accident near the end of 2017. Logs still move by rail on common carriers are in a few places, but the book on logging roads has apparently closed. The logging road was not the only old timber industry equipment or traditional technolo technological. The logging road was not the only old timber industry equipment or tradition technological advancement relegated to the dustbins of history. The rapid disappearance of almost anything usually triggers preservationist mindsets and movements in concerned circles. And muse museums, municipalities, and similar institutions started seeking out old logging equipment to preserve and display. Several museums dedicated to only logging industry displays have been created, and many other museums display old logging equipment. The second part of this presentation profiles logging and lumber industry related equipment placed on display in various settings around the West. Uh, start when, uh, when the Casper Lumber Company shut down its logging road in 1946, it dragged this Willamette Iron and Steel Works donkey, probably purchased new by the company about 1912, out of the woods to its then abandoning Camp 20. The Jackson State Forest has since developed the site into a roadside rest area with the donkey place on a prominent display just off Highway 20. Just visible in trees beyond in that first photograph is the large barn that used to house the tractor repair shop at the camp. Uh, unfortunately, it has since been demolished. As noted in the previous section, the Hobbs Wallen Company built a large mill in Crescent City about 1871. The company built a logging road running north of the city, later incorporated as the Crescent City and Smith River Railroad. The Crescent City and Smith River eventually reached 12 miles north to the town of Smith River on the banks of the, on the banks of the Smith River. The railroad built a bridge across the river and prepared to extend the line further north, but a major flood washed out the bridge in the spring of 1890, and the company never rebuilt it. 
The end of the CCNSR came in 1912 when Hobbs Wall cut out the last of their timber north of town and started building the Del North Southern into the holding south of the city. Several local residents discovered this old caboose body in 1987 lying on private land about a thousand feet off the CCNSR grade. The landowner donated the car to the Del Norte County Historical Society. Restoration of the car ended up being a long, slow process that stretched out over the next 20 years. And the car finally reached the point where it could be placed on public display in the Del Norte County Fairgrounds around 2001 or 2002. It's perhaps the only surviving rail car still in this isolated corner of California. In the last part of the section, we'll look at three locomotives with Redwood Empire routes that are on display elsewhere. In 1924, Pacific Lumber Company bought this large 90-ton 282 new from Baldwin for use on its mainline hauls, largely over the Northwestern Pacific mainline. Machines seen here in its builder's photograph before departing Pennsylvania for the West. The 35 served the Pacific Lumber well for over 30 years. It's seen here on the upper left on the Northwestern Pacific Main Line crossing the Van Dusen River Bridge, and then at the lower right, switching logs in Samoa, or not Samoa, Scotia at the dump. Diesels finally forced the number 35's retirement in the middle 1950s. Pacific Lumber sold it to a couple of rail fans who never got the resources to move it, so it remained a fixture in the Scotia yards. Movement finally came in 1971 when the Heber Valley Railroad of Heber City, Utah, better known as the Heber Creeper, bought the engine and shipped it to Utah, where they restored it to operation. The locomotive operated there until retired again by the early 1980s. In 1992, the state of Nevada bought large parts of the Heber Creeper equipment collection, including the number 35, for its newly created Nevada Southern Railroad Museum in Boulder City, Nevada. The museum has cosmetically restored the locomotive and placed it on display. There's one side note to the number 35 story. The Arcadia and Mad River operated a short-lived tourist train out of Blue Lake using its Shea number no. seven and 4X Southern Pacific commuter coaches. The train only ran between 1969 and 1971 when it suspended operations due to low ridership. The Heber Creeper also bought the four coaches around the same time they got the number 35, and the state of Nevada eventually bought them as well. The four one-time Arcade and Mad River cars today form the core of the Nevada Southern Excursion Train Set that operates out of Boulder City. 1929, Baldwin built this 2662 tank type Mally new for the Hammond Lumber Company operations out of Mill City, Oregon. Hammond transferred the machine to its Samoa operations in 1931, where they renumbered it number 12. The machine's large size largely kept it on the lower end of the line from Cornell to Samoa until the diesel previously discussed arrived in 1950. 1951, Hammond sold the number 12 to the Northern Redwood Lumber, who assigned it to the Arcade and Mad River after the locomotive proved too heavy for the logging road above Corbell. The ANMR used it until replaced by diesels again in 1956. Locomotive still had some life left though as Southwest Lumber Mills bought it. After 27 years of hauling fur and redwood, the number 12 worked its last three active years with its saddle tanks removed and replaced with the tender and hauling ponderosa pine out of the forest south of Flagstaff, Arizona. After being replaced by a diesel for a fourth time, the Southwest Lumber donated the number 12 to Coconino County, which has displayed it around Flagstaff ever since, first at a county park and for many decades now at the Arizona Historical Society's Pioneer Museum. The third steam locomotive with Redwood Region connections now elsewhere is this high built in 1921 for the Mount Town of Pius and Muir Woods Railway. That road existed to haul tourists from Mill Valley and Muir Woods up to the top of the Mount Tamalpais, uh, along with some popular gravity car rides from the top of the mountain back down. The locomotive only lasted three years in that service until plunging revenues forced its sale. 
Siskiyou Lumber Company of McCall, California bought the locomotive in 1924 and then sold it to the Dole Beer and Carson Lumber Company in 1938. Pacific Lumber Company acquired the high solar in 1953 and placed it on permanent display outside the company's small museum, along with some other equipment. The permanent display lasted 65 years as concerns over asbestos and lead paint caused the Scotia Community Services District to build fences around the equipment and then auction it off. An organization from Marin County known as Friends of the Number Nine submitted the winning bid and the locomotive is now stored on private property in the area while details of future display sites somewhere around the Mount Tamalpais and Mirror Woods Raid are negotiated. Several diesel locomotives with Humboldt County roots or connections are also on display. Warehouser bought the two Baldwin 750 horsepower demonstrator units for use on their logging roads out of Klamath Falls, Oregon. One of them was scrapped in the early 1980s, but the other former Baldwin demonstrator number 750 is now in private ownership and on display on the former Oregon, California and Eastern Railroad yards in Klamath Falls. The Roots of Motive Power in Willits has two local diesels in its collection, former California Western Railroad Baldwin number 53 uh, at the top displayed with the Simpson Timber Company locomotive out of Washington. And then the former Arcata and Mad River General Electric 44 Tonner number 104 in the lower right. Part three, repurposed. Not all remnants of the timber industry have either been abandoned or placed on display. A lot of locations where the industry once operated and equipment formerly employed in logging and lumbering have found new careers. Many are the former sawmill or related forest product plant sites that have been redeveloped into shopping centers or housing projects, often, often leaving no traces of the former industry. The buildings sometimes left behind after a timber related business closed can occasionally be used by other industries, often as light manufacturing or warehousing, but more commonly as equipment or vehicle storage. Old office buildings and other ancillary structures associated with timber enterprise can also be easily converted to non timber related businesses. Buildings and other physical facilities are not the only traces of the timber industry that have gone on to other roles. The rails to trails movement that has converted thousands of miles of abandoned rail lines to recreational trails has spread to a few former timber oriented short lines and a handful of logging railroads. The small size and relative mechanical simplicity of locomotives used in logging or lumber related railroading has made them a staple of the tourist railroad industry and the longevity attained by many woods locomotives ensured a relatively large number would survive. Several former timber dependent roads now derive most of all of their ex existence from tourists, sometimes just as attraction, while others sell themselves as representing and interpreting the history of the industry. Some tourist road operations with few to no historic ties to the industry use former timber industry equipment. The changing face and nature of the timber industry has deprived a large number of towns of the commercial base that in many cases prompted the creation of the town and or sustained the economy of an entire region. Communities left in the wake of the departure of the timber industry either face immediate abandonment or a long slow decline. Many former timber towns struggle to find new sources of revenue with tourism usually being the most prominent focus of the economic redevelopment efforts. The third part of this presentation will focus on profiles of buildings, communities, equipment, and the like in the post-timber industry world. Oak River Mill and Lumber Company Engine House was the only substantial building of the old sawmill town of Falk to survive the demolition of the rest of the town described in part one of this presentation. In 2008, the Bureau of Land Management carefully disassembled the badly deteriorated building and the adjacent sand dryer from the original site. The BLM then reconstructed the shop and built a recreated sand house around the dryer at a new site around across the river and downstream from their original location and adjacent to the hiking trail the agency was then developing into the town site and the headwaters forest beyond. The reconstruction work incorporated about 40% of the original materials from the engine house as the rest had become too decayed to be reused. Iron straps on the floor show where the rails would have been in the original structure. The building now houses the Headwaters Educational Center, containing various interpretive panels explaining the natural and human history of the area and how the two interrelate. 
plywood was first introduced into the United States around 1865, but it did not come into its own as a building material of choice until the immediate post-World War II era. Soaring demands for the material prompted many established forest product companies to add plywood plants to existing mills, while others built entirely new plants. Among the latter was the Mutual Plywood Company, which in the winter of 1948-1949 built a new large plywood plant in Fairhaven, just down the Samoa Peninsula from Samoa. U.S. Plywood Corporation purchased the plant in the very early 1960s, only to sell it to Simpson Timber Company in 1965 as part of a series of mutually beneficial transactions between the two companies. Simpson ran the plant until 1981 when timber shortages and market conditions forced its closure. The old plywood plant is now part of the Fairhaven Business Park owned since 2005 by Sequoia Investments X LLC. A year or two after that transaction, Fox Farm Soils and Fertilizer Company, a leading producer and supplier of organic fertilizers, soil amendments and other products, set up their storage manufacturing and distribution operations out of the old mutual facility. A couple old rail spurs still lead to the plant, though the present occupant has no use for them. And even if they did, the old Northwestern Pacific mainline south of Eureka has been impassable due to flood damage since the first days of 1998 anyway. On a related note, shortly after the Mutual Plywood built its facility, the Elk River Mill and Lumber Company was scrapping out its operations at Falk. Their Heisler number three had only seen about 10 years of service before being stored in 1937. The scrappers removed the boiler and cylinders and sold the rest of the locomotive to Mutual who installed a diesel engine and built a new car body over it and then put it to work switching the plant. Frank Bayless bought the unusual locomotive after it had been retired from that service. He displayed it at his Alton and Pacific Railroad in Alton, Northern California Logging Interpretive Association, now Timber Heritage Association, bought the unit in the late 1970s and it's now stored with the rest of the collection at the Samoa Town or Samoa Roundhouse. Logging has always been one of the most dangerous industrial occupations in the United States. The frequency and severity of injuries suffered on the job coupled with the remote location of most sawmill towns from major population centers caused most of them to have larger hospital facilities than what the town size might otherwise suggest. The old Pacific Lumber Company hospital building in Scotia is typical of many such company operated hospitals. Pacific Lumber operated the hospital up until the 1950s when improving highways made it feasible to start sending patients to the larger hospitals in Eureka instead of operating their own facility. The company used the building for offices, archive storage, and other purposes for several decades afterwards. In 2012, the Southern Trinity Health Services Inc. opened a satellite clinic facility in the old building. Lumber industry has provided vast financial rewards to a lucky few entrepreneurs, many of whom tended to express their wealth with mansions. Few such estates on the West Coast represented this better than the Carson Mansion, built by William Carson of the Dolbear and Carson Lumber Company. Carson invested $80,000 in building the mansion between 1884 and 1886, and the building is well noted as containing a mixture of every major style of Victorian era architecture. Carson is quoted as saying of his mansion, if I build it poorly, they would say that I am or was a damned miser. If I build it expensively, they will say I'm a show off. Guess I'll just build it to suit myself. Noted San Francisco architect, architects Joseph and Samuel Newston designed the building and specialty lumber from Central America, East India, the Philippines, and Mexico supplemented the local native redwood. Carson built the mansion on a hill directly adjacent to the DNC mill, and from it, he could monitor just, just about anything happening in his mill. The Carson family occupied the structure until they sold the company to the Pacific Lumber Company in 1950. A group of prominent Eureka businessmen bought the mansion from the family, and they set up the exclusive and private Inglemar Club named after a theater Carson owned to enjoy and maintain the structure and surrounding grounds. The DNC mill below the mansion is now a weedy field with only a few concrete blocks hinting at the industry that created the wealth that built the mansion. The mansion itself is closed to the public, but that doesn't stop it from being one of the most photographed buildings in California. <laughs> 
Looking somewhat out of place in the Arcata bottoms is the seemingly orphan steel truss bridge over the Mad River. The fascinating story behind the bridge started in 1895 when the Dole Beer and Carson Company decided to start logging their holdings up the Lindsay Creek drainage and signed a 10 year contract with the Vance family's Eureka and Klamath River Railroad, which was then building a new railroad from Samoa through Arcata and Essex and then north towards Fieldbrook. Part of this line replaced an earlier railroad. The EMKR delivered Dolbeer and Carson's logs to a log dump on the bay north of Samoa. The logs would then be rafted across the bay to the DNC mill. In 1900, prominent lumberman A.B. Hammond, who, as discussed, had operations scattered across the nation, bought the Vance companies, including the EMKR. Corporate shuffling resulted in the EMKR being conveyed to the Oregon and Eureka Railroad in 1903, which became part of the Northwestern Pacific and completed the line to Trinidad in 1907. Meanwhile, the Dolbeer and Carson owners deeply resented Hammond's incursion into the Redwood region. And in 1905, they finished the Humboldt Northern Railroad, shown in blue, which started handling all of DNC's log trains instead of continuing to give that business to Hammond after that first 10 year contract expired. The Humboldt Northern almost immediately received more traffic when, in 1906, signed a contract to haul lumber cut by the Little River Redwood Company mill at Bullwinkle, now Cornell, south to a wharf on the Samoa Peninsula. In 1929, the Little River Company built a new line running from Cornell west to the coast and then south to a new connection with the Humboldt Northern, shown in yellow. And then in the following year, the Little River bought the Humboldt Northern from the DNC after the DNC finished cutting through their holdings in the area. Little River promptly ran into financial problems and sold out to Hammond Company in 1931, which promptly replaced the NWP line through Fieldbrook with a new route consisting of the former Little River Redwood and parts of the Humboldt Northern Railroads connecting Cornell and Samoa. That line became the Hammond Main Line until it was abandoned in 1961. In recent decades, the Humboldt County Parks and Trail Department has constructed the Hammond Coastal Trail, stretching 5.3 miles from Mad River Bridge to Clan Beach and using parts of the old railroad grades. Thanks to an ironic twist of history, the grade is named after the guy who the original railroads were built to spite. One final note, the Humboldt Northern originally crossed the MAD with the covered bridge at this spot. Hammond replaced the structure with the steel bridge in 1942. Let's look at the two small locomotives on display in occasional operation at the Fort Humboldt State Park. In 1892, Marshutes and Cantrell built this gypsy locomotive for the Bear Harbor Lumber Company, who was signed at number one. Bear Harbor got its start cutting railroad ties and harvesting tan bark, and the number one initially made its living hauling those products down to the dog hole port at Bear Harbor. The company's plans involved pushing the railroad inland to Eel River, where a sawmill would be built. Constructing the railroad turned out to be a slow process affected by fires, financial troubles, and one big storm that destroyed the wharf. The railroad reached the banks of the Eel at the sawmill site in 1905. However, late that year, an accident at the sawmill, then nearing completion, claimed the life of one of the principal company managers. His death and then the San Francisco earthquake in 1906 doomed the project and the sawmill never opened. The smaller mills later occupied the site. The Bear Harbor Railroad lay abandoned for decades and parts of it may still exist. The number one by now named Gypsy sat abandoned in the small engine house near Moody until the company moved it to Andersonia across the river from Piercy in 1957. The family donated the locomotive to the state of California in 1967 who placed it on display at Fort Humboldt. Timber Heritage Association's predecessor restored it to operation in 1979. Locomotives has also made its mark in pop culture as it's the inspiration for Thomas the Tank Engine characters Dash and Bash, though they moved the gearing and capstan drums to the back of the locomotives to accommodate the signature locomotive faces. Noah Falk initially bought the other locomotive, Fort Humboldt, new from Marshutes and Cantrell in 1884. Falk used it in the sawmills in Arcata before conveying the machine to the Elk River Mill and Lumber Company as their number one. The number one named Falk almost single-handedly kept that company rolling for almost 20 years. 
a larger locomotive bumped the fault to switch in the mill in 1927 when the Heisler previously discussed caused its retirement. The city of Eureka acquired the Falk in 1937 and it saw some limited use on the city's streetcar line. This photo shows the Falk as a direct drive locomotive. A third cylinder mounted on the left side of the boiler powered the capstan drum. The city later conveyed the Falk to the state of California who placed it on display at Fort Humboldt State Park. In 1986, the forerunner of today's THA restored the Falk to service, and it's been in service on a short stretch of track at the fort ever since. Locomotive has also traveled as far afield as Canada to participate in special events throughout the years. In 1929, American Locomotive Company built Crossit Western Company numbers 10 and 11, both large 282 tank locomotives, for use on their logging road based out of Juana, Oregon on the Columbia River west of Portland. The number 10 is seen here en route from the factory. Fawcett ran out of timber to cut in 1942 and sold the pair to Hammond Lumber in Samoa who renumbered them 16 and 17. The 16 served the Hammond Railroad until it closed in 1961, then it languished in Samoa until 1966 when the Fortuna Kiwanis Club bought it for display in the park there. The locomotive was considered to be in the way by 1974, and Peter Rufflinger, a locomotive engineer on Simpson Timbers Logging Road out of Shelton, Washington, bought the 16 and moved it north. The locomotive operated occasionally on the Simpson Road until 2003. The 16 has changed hands a couple of times since and eventually landed in Yakult, Washington on the Battleground Yakult and Chilachi Prairie Railroad, who restored it back to its original lettering and number. The 10 operated occasionally from 2006 until the boiler certification expired in 2019. The locomotive is presently out of service pending a rebuild. 17 led, seven, uh, led a similarly interesting life. In 1945, a fire swept across the landscape north of Cornell, destroying several trestles on the Hammond Railroad. The fire greatly accelerated Hammond's shift from rail to truck logging in the area above Cornell. The 17 was among the equipment trapped on the wrong side of the burned trestles, and as Hammond had no real use for the machine, they parked it at the Gap, a logging camp northeast of Trinidad. The yellow lines on this map are the extent of the logging railroads built by the Hammond and the Little River Redwood companies in the area. The 17 would remain abandoned at the Gap for 20 years. 1965, as Peter Senate left and his business partner Dick Childs bought the 17 from Georgia Pacific, and trucked it out of the gap. The two men moved the locomotive to a small sawmill they operated near Klamath, California, where they built a small shed to house it. The two restored the engine to operation by 1966. The Peterson Mill lay a little less than a mile up Hoppa Creek from the large Simpson Mill, which gave all of its coal logs to Peterson. One item that's contradictory in the written records from the time is how much track Peterson had before 1966, or if he had built the initial line running down the creek specifically to run the 17. Regardless, Peterson also bought the self-propelled crane, likely also from Hammond, and a flat car used to haul the coal logs up to the mill. Between 1967 and 1969, Peterson extended his railroad up and over the top of the ridge above the Klamath River before descending on 8.6% grades through two switchbacks to a depot site established just off Highway 101 on Turwer Valley Road, now Klamath Glen Road. Three truck Heiser locomotive from the Pickering Lumber Operations in the Central Sierras joined the 17 and together the two hauled passengers on Peterson's Klamath and Hopper Valley Railroad. The Klamath and Hoppa Valley operated weekend excursions through the 1973 season when a variety of factors led to the road's demise. For those of you familiar with Klamath today, the Caboose Depot sat right about where the ticket booth to the drive through tree attraction is now located, and the road up to the tree uses part of the KHV grade. In 1980, the privately owned Western Forest Industry Museum bought the KHV's locomotives and moved them to the new. Mount Rainier Scenic Road in Southwest Washington. Mount Rainier finally restored the locomotive to service in 1995, and it operated until sidelined by new boiler regulations at the end of 2001. Railroad restored the locomotive again between 2011 and 2013, and it ended operation again by 2014. 
Unfortunately, the road now operated by a new owner as the Mount Rainier Road and Logging Museum was an early casualty of the COVID-19 pandemic. The operations closed in early 2020 and the 17 is with the other equipment waiting whatever comes next. Lastly, in this section, we'll look at the California Western Railroad. Logging Railroad development from Fort Bragg east to the Redwood Timber started in 1881. Several companies pushed the railhead farther east into the timber, mostly to haul logs to Union Lumber Company's large sawmill in Fort Bragg. Union Lumber incorporated the California Western Railroad and Navigation Company in 1905 to take over the railroad. Continued construction brought the railhead to Willits in a connection with the Northwestern Pacific in 1911. California Western existed primarily to haul finished lumber from Fort Bragg east to Willits and occasional raw log traffic back west to the mill. The company dropped the end navigation part of its name in 1947. Railroad offered passenger service for much of existence using the small rail buses nicknamed skunks because you could smell them before you could see them. The skunk car service became a tourist attraction in its own right and the popularity increased substantially in the early 1960s. That success prompted the railroad to expand its tourist offerings. And in 1964, they purchased this Baldwin 1924 built 282 from the Medford Corporation. It had spent its entire life to that point hauling log trains out of the woods east of Medford, Oregon. The excursion train dubbed the Super Skunk launched in early July 1965 and became an immediate success. As train sizes grew to match the increased demand, Railroad went looking for a larger locomotive. In 1968, they bought this Baldwin 2662 tank, originally built in 1937 for Warehouser's Longview operation as their number 110, seen at left. It later worked for Rainier on their logging road north of Grays Harbor, Washington, where it got the number 111 in a slope back tender. California Western removed the saddle tanks and enlarged the tender after it arrived in Fort Bragg. Unfortunately, the adhesion lost with the removal of the saddle tanks meant the locomotive never lived up to its expectations. Steam operations became sporadic after 1980, but diesel-powered trains and rail bus trips out of Fort Bragg and Willits remained strong. In addition to hauling tourists, the excursion trains also handled until 2002 one of the last railroad mail contracts in the U.S. Freight traffic dwindled through, the, dwindled through the 1980s and early 1990s and then ceased entirely But in 1998 after the Federal Road Administration closed the connecting Northwestern Pacific. The road has been beset by numerous calamities over the last decade, but continues to operate truncated tourist trains out of both Willits and Fort Bragg. Part four miscellaneous. Presentation to this point has dealt mostly with the physical manifestations of the timber industry history. This last part deals with the less tangible remnants, legacies, and tributes. One of the cornerstones of the timber industry propaganda in recent years is trees as a renewable resource. While this claim is entirely true, it's equally factual that the industry did not treat forests as renewable until the era after World War II. The geographic center of the lumber production started in Maine in 1840 and migrated to the upper Midwest over the next four decades, then shifted to the southern states and finally to the Pacific Northwest. Concepts of reforestation and trees as a replenishable crop really didn't mature until after the industry reached the Pacific and suddenly had no more fresh uncut stands over the next hill. The wanderings of the industry resulted in wholesale transplanting of names, social groups, and the like from region to region. It's hard to find a timber town in the Northwest that doesn't have a street named Minnesota, Minneapolis, Michigan, Milwaukee, Saginaw, or some other reference to an upper Midwest state or city. The former presence of the timber industry is marked in other ways. For, for instance, California alone has mill attached to at least 100 geographical features and sawmill associated with over 20 more. Another place, popular place to find timber industry tributes is in school or team mascots. Three universities, uh, Northern Arizona U University in Flagstaff, Arizona, Humboldt State University in Arcata and Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches, Texas, all use Lumberjack as their school mascot. Logger is the far more common mascot used by the University of Puget Sound and a lengthy list of high schools, including Eureka and McLeod in California, Vernonia, Sayo, and Mitchell in Oregon, 
Potlatch in St. Marie's in Idaho and many others. Professional supporting, professional sporting teams with timber industry inspired names include baseball's Williamsport Crosscutters of Williamsport, Pennsylvania and Major League Soccer's Portland Timbers. The award for the most creative mascot almost certainly goes to the Grays Harbor Community College Chokers and their mascot, Charlie the Choker, which references the logging occupation of choker setters. Last part of this presentation, we'll explore a few examples of these other traces of the timber industry and art names in other forms. Scenes of logging and lumber heritage are quite often depicted in murals scattered throughout the timber country. Centerpieces of this mural on the side of the building in my one time hometown of Blue Lake, depicting an idyllic summer day in 1910, is an arcade and Mad River Railroad narrow gauge train bringing another load of lumber from the mill in Corbell and headed for the wharf in Arcata through town. The ANMR grade is just out of view to the right and the mural faces the old ANMR depot that now houses the local museum. State of California established Humboldt State Normal School as a teacher's college in uh, 1913. The institution changed names several times, first to the Humboldt State Teachers College and Junior College in 1921 the Humboldt State College in 1935, California State University Humboldt in 1972, and finally to Humboldt State University in 1974. Humboldt named its sporting teams the Thunderbolts until 1936 when the school changed to the Lumberjacks. The school adopted Lucky Logger as its mascot in 1959. In 1968, a group of students reformed the school's long gone marching band as the Humboldt State Marching Lumberjacks, usually shortened to MLJs. The band is conducted by an ax major using an ax instead of a drum major, and the band uniform consists of work boots, green pants, yellow shirts, suspenders, and a yellow hard hat. The often irreverent MLJs have always been a student run and directed. In addition to school sporting events, the band marches and parades up and down the length of California. The band celebrated its 50th anniversary in November 2018 when 300 current and former band members gathered and performed at what is likely to be Humboldt's final ever home football game. The band is seen here performing on the Arcata Plaza in Halloween in 2018. Lastly, Albanian as the logging industry's mythological folk hero got its start in oral traditions in the logging camps of the upper Midwest. The character may or may not have started with an intertwined stories about two real French Canadians, a logger named Fabian Joe Fournier and a war hero named Bon Jean. The stories appear to have circulated through the camps for about 30 years before they first appeared in print about 1904. The legend of Paul Bunyan really took off in 1940. Red River Lumber Company released the first of its advertisements drawn by William B. Lafayette, the name of the company, the head of the company's marketing department. Red River got its start in Minnesota and then moved to Westwood, California in the middle 1910s, where it operated one of the largest pine mills on the West Coast for 30 years. The advertising campaign lasted until 1944 and consisted of many individual ads featuring stories about Bunyan and his exploits, plus periodic booklets. The booklets themselves contain stories about Paul interspersed with photos and other information about the Red River operations. Offeed's work defined the proportions and general look of Bunyan and created many ancillary characters, including Babe the Blue Ox. Many of the stories Lafayette used were original to him, while, while others were great embellishments of the older tales. For example, the illustration on the right accompanies one story of a time some of Paul's assistants sent the wrong logs down the Mississippi to buyers in Louisiana who refused to accept them. Paul's solution was to feed Babe a lot of salt and then deprive him of water for a day or so, so that when Paul did allow Babe a drink, the Mississippi ran backwards, bringing the wrong logs back up to the upper Midwest so the mistake could be corrected. Unfortunately, Lafayette's work has become the basis for almost everything that is currently known about the character and obfuscated much of the original tales. In many ways, Paul Bunyan and Babe are products of one of the most and least successful marketing campaigns. The least successful part references that very few people 
today. Remember the connections to the Red River Company that largely created the characters, but the most applies in that the characters have become nearly universal presence across timber country. At least 10 cities in Maine, Wisconsin, and Michigan claim to be his birthplace, and statues of Babe and Paul can be found almost everywhere trees grow. These statues of the pair measuring 49 and 35 feet tall greet drivers on Highway 101 at the Trees of Mystery attraction a few miles south of Crescent City, California. With that, I hope that uh, most of you are still awake, and I apologize for those of you that I put to sleep. Um, we, that's kind of the end of my presentation. Um, I'll leave this up. This is a selected bibliography and some of the photo credits of um, where I got some of the photos that are used in this presentation. And um, with that, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to see if I can answer them. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat window. And as we're waiting to see people type their questions in. Um, so next month, um, we will be doing on July 10th, um, the second Saturday, because the first Saturday is July 3rd and the library is closed for the 4th of July weekend. Um, so on July 10th, um, we will be, um, there will be a presentation on the Fortuna Rodeo. And um, this one is uh, special because we will, will not be recording it. So you'll have to watch it live if you want to catch it. So um, if you're here, you already are signed up. I'll send you the link to it. If you know somebody who would be interested in the Fortuna Rodeo, um, let them know, send them our way so we can get them signed up because it's going to be kind of a, you need to get in there and watch it live. Otherwise, you're going to miss it. Um, and with that, let's see. Um, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat window. Um, and other than that, I think that's about it. Um, like I said, we are recording this. I'll upload it onto YouTube um, on Tuesday. And we also have some other of uh, these lectures that are on there. Um, there was one on the history of the, um, uh, I think it was the Pacific Railroad. I don't know off the top of my head, um, that would be very similar to this, that um, if you like this one, you'll probably love that one too. Um, and then other than that, um, you know, libraries right now, uh, most of our smaller branches, every branch except, except for the Eureka main branch is open for modified in-person services. So we're calling it express services. You can go in, browse the shelves, check out a book, but we're asking people to kind of keep it um, short visits um, as we're still kind of progressing out of the pandemic. Um, and at every branch we do offer curbside pickup. So if you're not quite ready to do in-person, you can always request a book and we'll bring it out to your car. Um, and it looks like there are no other questions. So I will go ahead and let you guys go for the day. Thank you for joining us again. Thank you, Jeff, for your presentation. And we will see you guys next month. Thank you. Okay, thank you.